Kenya's biggest conversation celebrating four years since we first went on air when on the 20th of oh, August 2019 mm. and you've done well imagine <laughs> four years and we've been here Mm -hmm. Every weekday having Kenya's biggest conversation. We are commemorating this by saying thank you very much to everybody who's been watching us. Everybody who's been saying, wait, have you heard these guys? Tune in and listen to them. Or have you seen this conversation? Please, uh, can you comment on this? And all the guests who've come onto the show, including our guest this morning who's been here several times before, Gladys Boscholet, the Deputy Speaker of the National Assembly. Good morning. Good morning. Karibu sana. And thank you for having me. Karibu sana. Washimua. As we talk about devolution, that's why you're here this morning, let's begin with the day's proverb. City has the proverb, this is from which country? This country is called Burkina Faso. Mm -hmm. And their people, the people of that wonderful country are known as Burkinabe. Mm -hmm. Previously, it was called Apo Volta. Death is unable to speak to an ancestor. Death is unable, unable to speak to an ancestor. An ancestor. Deputy Speaker, mm -hmm. what's your interpretation of this proverb? I was just writing it down so I can think about it. So, an ancestor first, we have to think about it that way. Is already gone. Mm -hmm. Yeah, because the ancestor is already dead. Yeah. Mm -hmm. <laughs> so, death is unable to speak to them. Yeah, because they are already dead. Yes. So death can only address maybe the living because mm -hmm. it's, a, it's a something that is it's coming to us. Mm. Mm -hmm. So what do you think? So we have a fear of it. You see, an ancestor does, has no fear of death. We have fear of death because we are alive. We are the only ones who can be affected by death. Yes. Okay. Mm -hmm. Okay. Devolution. I saw you at the devolution conference. You yes. were there. You participated mm -hmm. um, very well at the devolution conference. Um, also read a speech representing the Speaker of the National Assembly and talking about the gains of devolution in the last 10 years. From your own perspective, as one who saw devolution coming in, one who even saw, let's see, the constitution, the promulgation of the constitution, or even the referendum itself, you're working at the IEBC then. Yes, I ran the referendum IEC. elections, yes. You ran the referendum election, you saw the new constitution come in, you saw devolution come in as the, the first registrar, chief registrar of the, judici of the new judiciary. And now, as a parliamentarian, has it lived to the dream of the crafters of the constitution? Um, I think in part it has, uh, not a hundred percent, but when you look at it now, uh, I remember there was a time when you'd have to go to Ministry of Roads mm. to be able to ask for a road in your village. But today you all have to do is go to the governor's office, uh, the care offices, the court offices are all in decentralized. So I think there's a beauty in, in a, in a devolution in that sense. Uh, the fact that if there is a bridge that's broken, you can walk to the governor's office and demand that it be fixed. Uh, if there is, you go to a hospital and the nurses are absent or the doctor is absent, before there was no one to complain to. But today you can actually go and see the CC, the, the CC in charge of health within the county. It's within traveling distance of you. So in that sense, it's powerful. Also, if you look at the job creation that has created in the, in the counties, uh, because before, it's like everyone had to come to Nairobi to work, but now it's created places, I mean, no, people now don't, nobody needs to come to Nairobi to be able to earn a living. Mm. Uh, contractors now are local. Uh, people who are employed as nurses don't have to be employed from Nairobi, they're being employed within the county. So in a sense, devolution has greatly uh, assisted in bringing services closer to the people. But of course we need to perfect that. There's still many challenges. I think in the first 10 years, I must say, this is my own personal opinion, that uh, many governors were involved in brick and mortar. Construction, construction, construction. But building doesn't give me health services. Mm. Health is devolved. Health services means I go to a hospital, there's a doctor, I'm diagnosed, I'm treated, and I go home and I get well. But in some cases, you found governors have spent 10 years putting up a building, which is not complete to this day. Mm -hmm. And in fact, I have a, a very good example in my own county, Ziwa Sub County Hospital. It's a seven story building that is still a shell. All <laughs> they did is put brick and mortar, mm -hmm. there's nothing. So you can't say that we achieved it. 
because that's still sad. Yeah. Um, they are, they are hospital, but when you compare yeah. with the Kirinyaga, and I must say credit goes to, maybe women are just great. Anwa Guru, she built a level four hospital in under five years, mm -hmm. fully with an oncology department, with doctors. Now, people aren't coming for cancer treatment to Nairobi, to Nairobi from Kirinyaga County. Mm. It's state of the art. It's just as good as Nairobi Hospital. If you look at what Governor Nanok did in uh, Narok, they used to come to Eldoret all the way from Lodwa for and ICU Turkana. services. Turkana. Yeah, Turkana. Mm. Today, I mean, within, during his tenure, now they don't come to Eldoret. They have everything there. So, yes, there are some success stories, but there are some that are no success stories. So I think um, what was exciting was to listen to the president explain to them there's not going to be business as usual. Mm. They, he talked about performance contracting, which is what, how do you measure your performance? Not that you built a, a shell of a hospital, but whether people are actually getting services. Mm. One of the things that he did speak about mm. um, uh, is that Corruption is something that gives him a bad feeling in his stomach every time he thinks about it. Mm -hmm. And even as we talk about how devolution has then progressed over the last 10 years, mm -hmm. we can't ignore the monkey on shoulders of devolution mm -hmm. being corruption. Yes. That the same county bosses that we speak of unfortunately have had their name tarnished mm -hmm. or their image tarnished by either things they choose to do or people under them choose to do. Mm -hmm. um, that's why we see some of the things that you mentioned buildings that have not been finished mm. and then somebody else coming and starting another one so people talk about devolution and corruption having been devolved now yes. to that level yes there is definitely a big challenge of corruption in the counties and it's something we must question ourselves for example you ask yourself as a governor if i have 10 years in office or at least five years why do you want to get involved in, co in construction mm. I could easily buy a building that's already been built or uh, lease a building because it's quicker so that I can just focus on equipping the hospital, sending stuff there and working on it. But they love construction because that's a good loophole for corruption. Mm. Why is everyone in involved in building, 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 you know? Even when you look at county assemblies, why am I constructing a county assembly office block? I could easily decide to rent a building or buy a ready-made building. But because of the issues of... So the, yes, there is a lot of corruption. It's sad. Um, and you ask yourself, what's your core business? Is to provide health services. You're not a contractor. You were not elected to, as a governor to construct. It's like when I was at the judiciary, I used to tell people, I do not, I do not even want to hear about the issue of... I did get involved in leasing buildings, buying buildings, because I said... I am not a contractor. Our main business is administration of justice. Mm. That's our main core business. Even the issue of running a whole fleet of motor vehicles, and then you're involved in, you're like a mechanic. So I tell them, I'm the chief registrar, I'm not a mechanic. Mm. Why can't we just lease these vehicles? Why are we buying vehicles? And you get involved, you have a whole department. So you find many counties, all of them have bought excavators, mm. they've bought drilling, borehole drilling machines, uh, and yet, Today, you ask yourself, how many boreholes? Because if you have your own machine as a county, you should be d drilling a borehole daily. It should, be, it should be active 24 hours a day. Yes, it should be active 24 that hours a day. Equipment. It means we should actually have at least 10 boreholes per ward. Mm. But, but you have the equipment, but then you have no uh, boreholes to show for it. And why were you buying that? that is a, you're not, your job is not to be in business, the construction business or the drilling business. That is the job of some, uh, somebody else who you can hire to do that. Mm. So it also tells the you their priorities yeah. are wrong. You, you, I always say, as a governor, if you just focused on two things, agriculture and health, believe me, this country will turn around. And if you listen to the conversation that the president had with them, he says, we are importing you know, billions of shillings worth of edible oil. Mm. Yet, m six counties in the Nyanza region can produce oil. The coast can produce oil, palm oil, coconut oil. Uh, the oil we use on our hair, which I used on my hair this morning, is an imported avocado oil. You could easily, we have avocado, we can grow avocados and we can process that oil. In fact, actually, you can process it in a cottage industry. 
So that's why he was, he was imploring upon them that we, begin, we need to rethink. Ask yourself, we're importing rice. And then we, we import rice, then we say we don't want GMO. Yet the rice we're importing is GMO anyway. Mm. You know, so we import the rice, we're importing rice, yet we have rice growing regions. Yeah. We have Kirinyaga, I think he said we have 120,000 acres available for rice growing. Mm. If you go to the Migori region, you have land lying fallow, yet it's a rice growing region. Only p parts of it have been used, less than 10%. Could so if the, if the governor there focused and says our niche will be growing rice mm. and the central government has said we can support you. So we need, the, I think he was telling governors you have to reboot your mind how you think. Having the industrial parks. Mm. Why did we say we're going to put... Uh, we're going to put a heavier, co I mean, a more tax on imported furniture because if you just had the equipment and a good working space for all those guys who are uh, doing furniture on the roadside, if you got them an industrial park where they have access to equipment, they can produce the furniture that we can use in this country. Mm. Yes. Mishimo, if you look at all those issues that you've raised, you know, in terms of what appears to have been the focus of the first two cohorts of governors, you know, putting the brick and mortar, putting things that people are looking at as tangible. Do you think this was driven by the citizens and what the citizens judge you as a leader to be? If you don't say that I brought this hospital, if people don't see a road that has been built, you know, we're coming from the Kibaki era where we attribute roads to Kibaki and say Kibaki brought roads. Mm -hmm. We forget all the other things that Kibaki did. Mm -hmm. But we talk about roads that Kibaki brought. No, I mean, So our governor is coming into office mm -hmm. and he's being judged by, so you are here, what have you done? No, the, yes. The, 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 like, that's what I'm saying, that initially what would happen is a governor, because, in fact, if you ask me, I would prefer if governors were appointed for so their CEOs. Like you'd have a CEO of Barclays Bank mm -hmm. or ABSA, whatever they call it now. Mm. That's the way it's supposed to be. But now what happened is because they are political, so you find them that they are launching a road. They are launching the building of a hospital. They are putting the first brick. But you know what? After a while, they might gain you political traction at that time. But after a while, people realize, but you have no hospital. So you see that the lasting, so it's, uh, you tell yourself, do you want a quick, uh, quick uh, political gain? Mm. Or do you want long-lasting political A sustainable political project. Because eventually people say we still don't get health services. Yeah. So what you you've, you've constructed, but we can see it. We can see that seven-story building. But we cannot go in there. Because we cannot go in there. And there's, yes. Which brings in so, the other layers So eventually people, Kenyans are beginning to figure it out. So maybe the governors in the first 10 years got away with it. it but believe the me, the current governors are not going to get away with it. Because Kenyans know what they want. The legislators, all right, mm -hmm. from the county assembly to the National Assembly, to the Senate, the oversight role, do you think those three houses have played their oversight role sufficiently to support devolution? I think uh, what has happened with the, the Senate, the Senate really should be the ones oversighting the governors. The Senate should be the ones going around the country, going to check out the hospitals. Why is this hospital not complete? Why is it that's been stalled for the last three years? Is it a challenge that they haven't gotten funds? Is it a challenge that the contractor, you know, is not doing their job or, and so on? That way they can actually help the governor mm -hmm. work better. Unfortunately, uh, our Senate has been more focused on doing oversight on the executive. They've been, uh, the National Assembly summons a minister and then the next day is summoned by the Senate. So I think if the Senate can reboot their minds and realize that they should be focusing on the governors, they should be, they should be the ones taking on KEMSA. Why are the drugs delayed in reaching the counties? Mm -hmm. They should be summoning KEMSA on that issue. If, uh, if it's a case of a project where it was part uh, funded by national government and part funded by the, the county, they should also be interrogating those. So I think if they were very keen on their oversight role, they can actually help the counties perform better. Are, uh, you, are you saying you don't think the Senate has performed its role? Yes, I think so. <laughs> is it? I, I think they can do better. Is it because of a clash between the National Assembly and the Senate? Where in some cases, mm. you've talked about KEMSA, 
why then is the National Assembly summoning the leadership of KEMSA about uh, procurement and all? Why not just leave it to the Senate then too? No, the, I think uh, you, ha you have to, that's what I'm saying, their roles have to be clear. But mm. with time, I'm seeing it getting more clearer. For example, the National Assembly can summon KEMSA on the issue of procurement because a budget issue. And the budget is appropriated by the National Assembly. Okay. So they can do that. But it, when it, in terms of uh, disp uh, dispersing the distribution, of the, of, distribution the of the drugs to the counties, then Senate should be saying, we are getting complaints from the counties mm -hmm. that the drugs are not arriving on time. Or that when you delivered the drugs, it was just malaria drugs. Mm. Yeah, and, and so on. And, and not see, the others. Yes, and so, you know, how to see how to improve it. Uh, for example, I know that some counties which are doing very well is that they have an arrangement with KEMSA where the drugs are delivered directly to the sub-county hospital, not through the central county headquarters. Yes. That way, each uh, hospital is able to request drugs that are specific to that area. Because mm. mm. one area might need, you know, a respiratory problem, they have respiratory problems, a prevalence, so they need the medicine for that. Mm. Or in some places, a malaria zone, and so on. But in some counties, you find that the medicine is centrally is received by the county headquarters. By the time it gets to the sub-county hospitals, it's a long range. Uh, I know some successful counties, what they are doing is that uh, the local hospital has its own board of, uh, board of manage board, management board, yep. which is local. Yep. And then when they receive any money they earn, they are able to appropriate it for buying whatever they need mm -hmm. within the sub-county hospital. Mm. In other counties, the money is sent back to the county headquarters and it hardly comes back to them. Mm. But there are some success counties who have done that. I know that Elgeo Marakwet has done that and what they do is that they receive whatever money they earn, they can be able to buy their little disposables and so on, and then but they have to account for it. So when they do get an appropriation from the headquarters, they are able to offset on what they receive. What they so spent. you find that the medical superintendent in that hospital is able to work better mm. than in others. Mm -hmm. So I think uh, this is an opportunity mm. also for counties to learn from each other. Look at an county that's doing so well. Like I think Senate should visit Kirinyaga and find and, and the Turkana County and find out how Governor Nanok and Governor Waiguru managed to build that hospital in such a short time, fully equipped, fully functional, that it's, uh, that it's, it's working. working. Yeah. Yes. You know, when you talk about these roles of oversighting and supporting devolution in terms of legislation, so the Senate can come up with all these laws about legis uh, legislation that would support devolution, that would help uh, make these things easier. For example, if it's about ring fencing funds that are collected from uh, at the hospital and not having to send it to the county, uh, accounts but then spending it at source that's a legislation issue that needs to be supported by senate but there are very many instances where you've seen the national assembly and the senate engaging in sibling rivalry mm. where there are several cases that have even gone to court the national assembly where you sit now and the, where you've sat even in the previous in the 12th parliament and the senate taking each other to court over duties who should perform this function mm. is that not affecting devolution when these two houses don't seem to understand where their roles begin and where they end and they, where they are concurrent. There's a, there's a lot, that actually is not even an issue of legislation at the national level. This is legislation, regulations, delegated legislation that is done at the county assembly. So it's a matter of operations within the county. You don't even need to come to the national government for it. So I can give you a good example. In the 12th parliament, I remember I was chairperson of delegated legislation in the National Assembly. Then the Senate had, a, uh, had also had a committee of delegated legislation. Yes. But they wanted to oversight the same legislation by the executive, you know, by the ministers. But really what they should be oversighting is the delegated legislation at the county level. Mm. Because that's where the problem is. You will find that Nandi County, which is 42 kilometers from Eldoret, has different legislation for trade. Yep. Then you come to a single issue, we have different legislation. Then you go to Elgeo Marak, whatever, different legislation. You get to Baringo, Transoya, different, different. legislation. Mm. What it does, it makes it easier for people to do business. I mean, difficult for people to do business. So what the Senate should be focusing on, harmonizing that. And I remember at that time I engaged Honorable uh, Pogisho, who was the chairperson of delegated uh, uh, legislation in the Senate. And I said to him, focus, in fact, 
you can be so busy just doing that. Mm. Because if you can help the counties harmonize that, then makes it easier for people to work. Mm. For example, the counties <coughs> are losing a lot of money in the revenue collection. Mm. Mm -hmm. Most of it actually is lost through corruption. They can raise much more. Mm. You find that, uh, I remember one time going to pay for the women for the day. Mm. They had to pay 40 shillings each to be able to, for the market day. Yeah. And uh, that's why I asked, how do I pay this money? And I was told pay it in cash. I was like, what? People pay cash in this day and age? <laughs> <laughs> so, of course, how much of it is going to the county? Yeah. Have you seen all those roadblocks where they have county revenue collection? Yes, that says, a little booth says, yeah. says it's collected in cash. Yep. Do you think that money makes it to the to the to the government? Some of it. <laughs> a, a, small, a, a very small, small portion of it. Of it. <laughs> yes. So sometimes you can improve your revenue collection mm. just by tightening the, changing the manner in which you collect revenue. Mm. And I have a very good example. Now, as at the judiciary, we started something called Faini Chap Chap uh, using M-Pesa at Kibira Law Courts. Mm -hmm. The revenue we used to collect was like 50,000 shillings thereabouts per day. Just launching Faini Chap Chap. Mm. It went to over 500,000 a day, <laughs> just at the launch of it. Mm. But of course, as soon as I left, they killed the process. Yeah, because it doesn't work for people mm. who want to steal money. So we, f and, I, and I like the fact that there's a clear decision by government now that we should digitize mm. government services. Because if you could, if you just said no more paying money, cash, cash you pay it through other means. And even then, the let it be one portal, because also have a yeah, because there are collection. some places who said we are now collecting money, uh, you know, by USSD here. Yes, exactly. Ex but the problem is, it was going to an account, so there are two accounts. Mm -hmm. So some goes to this account, some goes to that account. To the other. Mm -hmm. Yes. Yeah. So that has to change. So these are realities, and I, I and that's why I said when the president says it's not going to be business as usual, it shouldn't be business as usual. Because mm. that must change. And they're being told we will have one uniform mm. payment system. Um, the other day, I had some guests arriving from overseas. And we were waiting for them at the immigration place. And then when they got there, they said, we want, we've been asked to pay for the visa. But they want cash. They won't accept their cards. So I asked myself, you mean there's a place where you still collect? So that $50 they pay, mm. does it really make it? To the government, who collects, that guy who's collecting 50, why do they want cash? So then, anyway, I had to go to the bank downstairs, get dollars in cash, and take it up to my guest to pay. And in fact, actually, I, I, I made a note that I need to call the PSB talk and just let him know that What's that happening? cannot happen. Mm. Yes. Not why don't you damage. have a, a card machine there? Why don't you have the M-Pesa? Because inevitably, somebody who's coming from overseas, the only payment method you have when you travel mm. is your it's credit card. card. Yeah. Mm. So why is it that we don't have a card machine? Is it because we don't have card machines in Kenya or is it because there is a bigger racket? And those are conversations that need to be held. Moshimua, I just want to go back into the relationship between the National Assembly and the Senate. Now, because you're a leader of the National Assembly, your speaker of the National Assembly is a former two-term member of the Senate and a former member of the National Assembly. So now we have leadership at county level, at Senate, at National Assembly, people who have actually interacted with both levels of government and both levels. Now, several bills that were coming out of the Senate in the 12th Parliament would be uh, transmitted to the National Assembly and because of time, they died. Several of them came to the National Assembly, the 12th Parliament, and they died there. The Honorable Sakaja, who was then a senator, who is now a governor, came up with a bill on startups. That bill was transmitted to the National Assembly because of time, died. There was another one by Senator Farhia, which was looking at how counties can pay their bills on time. And this was on uh, pending bills. Again, transmitted to the National Assembly, gets to the National Assembly, joins the queue, and it's kicked down the road, it dies. So when the National Assembly becomes the stumbling block to bills that are emanating from the Senate, that's a bad thing, isn't it? Yes. As a leader of the National Assembly, what do you want to, what 
are you doing now to make sure that this don't happen? I think what has happened now is that uh, the current, the both speakers of the house have actually had very serious conversations about those issues. They've made very, you'll listen to the speaker of the National Assembly. He's now giving timelines to the committees. It's actually not that the fact that it has gone to the Senate and come back to the National Assembly, that takes time. It's sometimes that it's in the, the committee and then it's so slowed down mm -hmm. at the committee. And you must remember in the last parliament there were serious problems because what happened is the first crop of chairpersons were, were removed and then people like me and then a new set of uh, chairpersons came in mm. and there was a push and pull because like the, the majority party no, had no, split. Tanga, tanga, weke. Yes, yes. So mm. there, there was a split in it and so... Like I found that uh, during my tenure, which was not very long, I think it was two years, mm. we were still rated as the highest performing committee in parliament and with the highest number of reports ever in the history of parliament. That means since independence. But the moment that uh, the next chairperson took over, that committee like died. So it was also the confusion. So that was the challenge and many of the bills now have come to the 13th parliament mm. and both speakers of the house agreed that they can be carried over if the member who had uh, who had sponsored the bill is no longer in parliament members have been encouraged to adopt it okay so you'll find that there are several bills uh, that have been adopted that were from the previous uh, parliament mm. and in many of them they don't even have to go through the pre-publication scrutiny because it had already happened so there's there's been ways to speed it up and I think now there is more conversation, there is more uh, synergy between the two houses than was in the 12th parliament or the 11th parliament for that matter. Mm. Uh, because the lessons have been learned. At the beginning, there was a supremacy battle. If, you, if during the constitution making process, what happened was that many of the people were members of the National Assembly who were participating in it. Yeah. Uh, and so they gave a lot of powers to the National Assembly forgetting that many of them would end up in, <laughs> in Senate. <laughs> many of the senior ones mm. in yes, the National Assembly. Yes, yes. <laughs> so, but, but I think uh, that, and I think the lawsuits between Parliament and the National Assembly were good because it has allowed the Supreme Court to pronounce itself on many of those issues. So it's, it's getting, it's always when you start something, it's hard, mm. but it gets smoother because there's more clarification. It's the same thing I say about elections. The fact that uh, uh, cases were filed against the presidential petitions, a uh, presidential election, and against even the, the parliamentary elections was a good thing over the years because the law became more clarified. Yeah. So you'll see that IEBC, in 2013, they had many mistakes. In 2017, from the pronouncements of the court, they perfected it. Mm. And then from the pronouncements of the court in 2017, they perfect by 2022, they were on top of their game because there was clarity. Before there wasn't clarity. In fact, this year, you know, there, are very, there were very few uh, mm. uh, petitions yep. on the, on the, what on is the election. The elections, county assembly and also parliamentary. And of course, the lawyers tell me it's bad for their business. <laughs> <laughs> no, let's look at that. Because, but we'll reach a point. Yeah. Yeah. So right now, nobody goes to court because you know what the outcome will be. Mm. And you, you need a certain threshold of evidence for you to sustain that. Yeah. So many people have realized I don't want to waste my money on election petitions. So it tells you that uh, having lawsuits is a good thing. Okay. Let's look at how things have progressed, even as we talk about um, devolution and how that has progressed over 10 years. This current administration has been um, in this position for the last one year, mm -hmm. and there are many things that are happening as a result of that. We saw that with the devolution conference that took place to kick off, essentially, what will happen development-wise in the counties over the next, you know, five years, right? Now, how would you say things have happened, the kind of synergy that you're hoping then will happen between the executive, between the National Assembly, county governments, and with all the other things that are happening around this whole circle since the election that took place in August last year? It's been about a year. Um, are these signs of good things coming? Yes, I think uh, if you saw in the past when devolution started, uh, the governors basically behaved like they were mini presidents running their own little countries mm. and that the national government was some other monster. Mm. 
So there was a, there wasn't really, they felt like don't interfere with our work. This is our mandate and so on. Mm. But I see what has happened since the last election is that there is very close working relationship an interdependent working relationship between the national government and the county governments, mm -hmm. which is a good sign. Uh, for example, just something as simple as uh, what they used to call the community health volunteers. I think now they are being called community health volunteer uh, promoters. Mm. And basically, the national government reached out during the first summit that the president held with the governors, and he said to them, we need to make the, we employ these people. They're going to help us with primary health care. And the national government said, we shall pay for half the amount. The counties will pay the other half. Mm. And that has been rolled out. I saw that. I know it's been rolled out in Kakamega. Uh, Governor Lusaka has a very, uh, pro very good uh, system, I think. And that is also being done in conjunction with the national government. I think uh, I heard that the Ministry of, Minister of Health was trying to get them handheld devices where they can put in data. So you find that one volunteer is dealing with 100 households. And basically, if that is caught in time, yeah, some of these illnesses and so on, it will cost us less to treat the person. Mm. And then we have a less sick population. I will use the example that uh, when I had the Jiga campaign cleanup in Wasingishu County, yeah. actually, the people who told me which place had Jigas were the community health volunteers. Because mm. mm. they're the ones who know people household by household, something that the county can't know. Mm -hmm. So... The fact that the government is now recognizing them yeah. and that the county is hiring them yeah. and that the data they collect and the information is reaching the county directly yeah. is, is working very well. It's moving things forward. It's very moving well. forward. There's and a it's problem though, mm -hmm. Moshimiro. When the national government says we will hire and employ some of these community health workers, mm. don't you see a problem? This is a devolved function. Why is the national government saying we shall retain this function and help you employ your employees? Why not put that money into the uh, kitty for devolved government so they can hire their people? No. Same thing has been raised about the national government building markets. Mm. Markets are not a national government issue. It's a county issue. You see, the, what was happening is that the, this was actually on conversations with the gov uh, governors. I did attend the, f uh, the summit briefly in Naivasha. Mm -hmm. The governors themselves say we don't have enough resources from what is allocated to us to do some of those projects. So the, 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 the national government does have resources to do that. So what they're saying is that we shall build the markets, but we shall hand them over to the counties. The counties can agree on the design, they're the ones who will provide the land, it's just the resources that are going to be given by the, uh, the national government. And after that, even the revenue collected from those who rent the markets will go to the counties. Mm -hmm. So it was actually a way of supporting the counties in places where they had shortfalls. And uh, even pr the, health, uh, the community health promoters, the county says, we are stretched. We do not have any more resources to pay for this, to employ more people. Yeah. So the county, gov the national government says we shall chip in. What they're actually doing is these are employees of the county, except the, the, the government is supporting part of the, the amount required to pay for these people. And I think that is how it should be. It's the way we agree that roads, there are certain roads that counties build. There are certain roads that are built at, uh, by the Kenya National Highways, Kenya. Hmm. Then there are others that are ku under Kura because they are designated. You know, Mishmua, mm -hmm. the for the longest time, one of the things that uh, I'm contributing to what you're saying has always existed are market days. All over the country, yeah. market days. Now, the issue you speak of with regards to community health promoters who are workers it's actually informed by data. It's informed by research. Hmm. And they exist. The community yes. health volunteers exist. They, except they, they were ex volunteers. They were volunteers who were supported by partners. Hmm. Now, there was a community strategy that was implemented in 2012 in the regions where the prevalence of HIV was at its very highest. They came up with some of these models. What you speak of is actually supported by data. There was a program that sought to determine the use, the help, and the effectiveness of community, lay community people. Mm. 
without any, even the most basic of, 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 of any health training, to diagnose malaria, pneumonia, and uh, um, I'll come up with the third one, mm. to diagnose it at a community level and to even treat it. Mm. It's called ICCM. Integrated diabetes. Yeah, that, yes. Now, they were taught blood pressure. They could do it because they were equipped. Mm. They were trained. Lay people who had not didn't have such training. Now that three year study came up with the findings that just those processes in the areas where it, the study was conducted it reduced hospital visitation by something like seventy five percent. So it, it's it's something that works. And that is being implemented is a wonderful thing. The archives at the Ministry of Health are full of studies that if w they were implemented, the preventative and promotive aspect of our healthcare that we keep speaking of would be sorted out conclusively. But it's never because the curative aspect where you have to buy many, many things is always more profitable now for the markets. These things that we're doing, uh, is it informed by data? Is it informed because we have practice? Mm. Has that practice been collated, collected, analyzed, so that when they say we are building, I'm saying this because you also go around the country and you'll find marketplaces built empty because they are far away, some of them, from the, 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 the center where people work. It's new, it's beautiful, but very little traction. Mm. We saw in Nairobi here the number of times they've tried to move the so-called hawkers to some center. How has that worked out? So again, as the government implements these things, the intention we can see is clear. But are the actions supported by data? Is it data-driven? You know, I think it's also, uh, we need to, to create discipline within the country. If you drive along the country, you will find that all along the roadsides, uh, people are selling wares and, you know, it's basically, all, the entire roadside is a market. Mm. And that is why you <laughs> saw the accident that happened in Kericho. Mm. It was a disaster. That shouldn't happen. So you provide the market for them, but you will make it compulsory for them to move to the market. It, it will create discipline. In many places, people said we don't have a market. By the way, the few markets that were built, they, they are not, there are not many of them, and some of them were put in the wrong place. You yeah. also have to put the market near where people... Location, location, location. Yes, it has to be where people can easily reach, where people habitually... Uh, go to. Mm. So it's going to be a much more strategically well thought out place. There are many places where the woman says, you know, we are doing this in the open air, Tonachoma, Najua. They are, and it's not just going to be building the markets uh, just to have a shade. It's also if you, because I think that was the concept that was done before, you just build a structure yes. to have a shade. Yeah. But if you put cold rooms there mm. and people can know that I'm not, my tomatoes will not go rotten that I can have a cold room for my potatoes. When you create those services, it will actually, there has to be an incentive for someone to move off the road and go there. Mm. So that was the problem, is that the initial concept was... It was misplaced. It was misplaced, yes. Right. It was, I'm, so I'm going to just stay under a shade for what? Why? Yeah, yeah, for And I'm reason. far away from the people. Mm. But when you put those, people will begin to move to those markets. If you tell them that there is uh, water facilities there, there is washrooms. Yeah. Because that was a big challenge. Clean washrooms. Many, when you go around speaking to people, they'll tell you there are no bathroom facilities. Yep. There is no water. There is no cold room facilities. There is no storage facilities. Mm. Yeah. Yes. Moshimo, I've got to end here with the, the, the looking back at last week. We met in Eldred, mm. very clean town, by the way. Mm. The, the people of Eldred have kept it's the beautiful. city of champions. It should become a city <laughs> again. It was delayed because Senate and all. Mm. But there were also complaints mm. in Eldred around this time about the Canada Finland airlift. But Moshimo, as a woman rep of that county, you've been eerily quiet about this issue. Why? I was deliberately quiet because I did not know of, of how this happened. When I sought information of what transpired, I did not get the information from the right authorities. Because I always tell myself, I always speak on facts. Mm. I don't pick up rumors from the street. I wanted to find out. I kept on telling. In fact, I remember when I would ask me, Mama Mbona would just say Makitu. And I told them, even me, I'm trying to understand what exactly transpired. Because we should have gotten guidance from the former uh, senator, from a governor, governor and the current governor. 
They are the ones who are in the know. They are the ones who are in charge of those accounts. But uh, with time now, because of course of the investigations, we've begun to understand what it was. It was sold as a scholarship, but it was not really a scholarship. Mm -hmm. Parents were paying. Mm. And, when, and parents were only paying a certain amount uh, of money. Yep. And then their children would get visas and they would go overseas. But we also find that uh, parents weren't informed that once your child goes overseas, you, you still have to pay. Mm -hmm. Because in some of them, the parent was told pay 1.1 million. And mm. the parent thinks that after you pay the 1.1, it's done. That's enough. Okay. It's not enough. Mm. When, I, when you look at the school fees required by that university in four years, it's 4 million shillings. Yeah. So is that parent capable of paying the 4 million? Moshimo, are you saying end? that during this time when parents were selling pieces of land to contribute to this you are still woman rep yes you are still a leader in this area are you saying you were not aware that this was happening the, the, yes I, I heard about harambe is happening but the information we got and which is public is that it was a scholarship and i assumed it was, i thought the county was paying for it mm. and uh, if you know my style of politics i never get involved in anything the county is doing i have my own programs I'm very clear about... What not your monkey, not your forests. Yes. What do you think should happen now that it's very clear what has happened? I think uh, money should be reimbursed to the parents uh, who paid money. And I think that program should be shut down. What about the students who've already gone to Finland? Yes, and that is now... You have to decide. think about the students who've already gone. How are we going to sustain them there so they complete their studies? Mm -hmm. I think it's something that... Um, the county government must deal with because we can't also have a situation where those children come back sure. they must complete their studies mm -hmm. but for now we should stop sending children there until we have a clear uh, methodology of doing this and then we must also sensitize the parents that it is not actually a scholarship mm -hmm. you'll be expected to pay for your child and when your child goes overseas they only work for 40 hours maximum according to a student uh, work a student visa mm -hmm. which is only it's not sufficient to sustain them do you think the yeah. leadership of wasingishu not just the then governor or the then county executive the then county assembly members the then woman rep the then members of the national assembly the then the then senator should have become more involved more inquisitive then you know in my mind if the you know, for me, I respect authority. If the governor says that I'm launching a scholarship program, I say very good. I assume that it, says, it is what it says it is. It, it never occurred to me in my wildest dreams that this was actually uh, not true. I did not know that monies that had been taken for certain students was used to pay for other students. And you see, really, that is wrong. Because that's, uh, if you take money from me, to pay for my child, then you use that money to pay for another child. That is a, that is a, a you know, it's actually, what is it called? Uh, obtaining money by false pretenses. Because <laughs> you lied that it was for my child, mm. and then you paid it for another child. Mm. So th th those are the things that are now emerging. It was, in fact, if you remember, not much was talked about it, about this issue. It was just scholarship, scholarship. Mm -hmm. That's what we knew. So what mm -hmm. should happen to the individuals who sold it as one thing, but it was actually another thing? And I think we're skirting around instead of saying because they are actually government officials or previous, um, mm -hmm. you know, uh, county officials, doesn't matter what level, what should happen to them? No, I think, uh, I think if... Uh, I think investigation be done. Who collected the money? To which account was it taken? And who... Uh, who was in charge of paying to the wrong people instead of paying for those who went there? Where did the money go that was collected from parents? And based on that, I think ESCC can do its job. And whoever is found culpable, of course, the law will take its course. Yeah, because that is prosecution, yes, punishment, yes, and uh, reimbursement. There's laws in this country against that kind of uh, issue. The the um, and, and, that's, and that's why I'm saying there's a lot of misinformation. A lot of the mm. parents did not even know that, that, the money was, that there was no scholarship, really, that they, were pay, they had to pay for it. It was a con game. Mm. This is The Situation Room, the only way to start your day.